I was born here in Cambridge and spent uh, about 15 years of my early life uh, growing up in Somerville across from Foss Park and then the South Shore in Holbrook, uh, two Canadian parents. So uh, not only uh, do I have dual citizenship, I'm bilingual, I can speak both American and Canadian. <laughs> Um, and there's really no difference. It's just if I speak Canadian, I just apologize for every slide I show. Uh, okay. Um, so the, what I'd like to do uh, with the time we have today is basically uh, orient you a bit to the region that I'm from, the, uh, uh, the Greater Golden Horseshoe, as it's called. Uh, and that's probably a term that's not widely known uh, outside Canada or the region, but it basically refers to a kind of a nickname it picked up because of its horseshoe shape. And, and golden uh, because of its uh, great agricultural lands and, and the, uh, being the manufacturing uh, center of Canada. I'll give you a very brief highlight of uh, the kind of planning system in Ontario so perhaps you can get a bit of an understanding and uh, appreciation uh, of the role of the province uh, in planning and its relationship to lower tier or municipal governments. And if I use terms that may not be uh, domesticated here, please put your hands up and I might be using some some terms that I thought were transparent but may not, may, not, may not be, and then talk a little bit of the development of the plan because I think there's a bit of an important history there of how it came to be and some of its uh, overriding policies. And then, uh, as Armando said, I'll speak a bit to uh, implementation because that's what we're fairly obsessed with right now. Um, but just by way of background where the Ministry of Energy and Infrastructure, it's kind of a, 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 kind of a not a very romantic title, uh, but it came about recently, about a year ago, uh, merged the two ministries of energy with the Ministry of uh, Public Infrastructure Renewal because Ontario is, is, is for a number of reasons, going through uh, a reinvestment and renewal of its energy uh, capacity and infrastructure in the province. And the ministry, the previous Ministry of Public Infrastructure was as well a more recent uh, creation which uh, with this, uh, this new government, when they came to power, they took the capital financing and um, planning function out of the Ministry of Finance, merged and, and took us out at the Smart Growth Secretariat. We were housed in Municipal Affairs and Housing, put us together. So I guess the upshot of all of this is it's great to have one minister going to bed uh, worried about the uh, sustainable energy, the infrastructure investments that the province is undertaking, as well as the long-term strategic planning. So at least in that one brain of, and very uh, acid-filled stomach, uh, we have you know, the kind of a, a nexus of, uh, of uh, bringing together a policy. And there has been a tremendous uh, increase in infrastructure in the province in the last couple of years. We probably spend about $6 billion a year normally uh, the last, this fiscal year and next, we'll spend a total of $23 billion, mainly owing to uh, major investments in transit as well as in stimulus capital. <coughs> but to orient to you to uh, where I'm from, the Greater Golden Horseshoe, of course, has the city of Toronto uh, in its center, and it is surrounded by a highly urbanized uh, area, again, surrounded by a 1.8 million acres of protected green space called the Green Belt, which uh, this government uh, established about four or five years ago, uh, basically uh, adding together uh, some previously protected lands but expanding it. Uh, and then, of course, then we have the so-called outer ring. Um, and, and the delineation in governments there you see are, are either large cities or uh, what we call regions or county governments. Uh, and underneath those, uh, there'll be a series of uh, lower tier governments. Uh, right now, there's about eight and a half million people, and it is growing uh, tremendously uh, by about 3.7 million people, we forecast, and 1.8 million new jobs by the year 2031. And that is fueled primarily uh, by immigration. Uh, and in owing or at least contributing to the complexity of our task, that region is very large, about 12,000 square kilometers, um, encompassing some. Uh, 110 separate municipal governments. As I mentioned, it is uh, diverse on the one hand, very urbanized as you see from the city of Toronto, uh, but there's also uh, a lots of smaller or still large cities and mid-sized cities, uh, places like uh, Waterloo, uh, uh, you may know it from the home of RIM and, and, and the world of Blackberries, but also our steel city Hamilton, uh, 
uh, which sits at the kind of corner of the horseshoe, our steel town, if you will. And of course, we have our Oshawa, which is kind of our version of Detroit um, and auto manufacturing. But it is also surrounded by some of the best agricultural lands, certainly in Canada, and natural features such as the Niagara Escarpment, which is a U, uh, UN World Biosphere, as well as the Oak, Mich Oak Ridge's Moraine, which is an important uh, recharge area. But I mentioned immigration, and uh, I, this uh, slide um, is somewhat surprising to people. Uh, basically, it says 46% uh, of the current residents in Toronto were born in another country, uh, and that compares to about 27% uh, in New York City. Now, grant you, there's a bit of a numerator-denominator issue there and the, the kind of historic patterns of immigration, but nonetheless, uh, it does uh, speak to the attractive nature for uh, immigrants to come to Toronto because of its diverse nature and the fact that there's well-established immigra uh, immigrant communities. Um, and the other thing I'd comment about uh, Toronto immigration is that uh, it is a fairly diverse immigration base. If you were to take a look at the top four countries of or uh, origin, about 25% of New York's immigrants come from their big four. That number lowers itself to 15 in Toronto, and that's just, again, owing to the fact that uh, more countries or people from more countries uh, uh, come to the city of Toronto. And again, that's a great source of our, our, our growth pressures and our, our, and our opportunities. Uh, it has been fueling growth. It will contribute to about 80% of that growth I talked about to the year 2031. And obviously, it is susceptible to short-term economic fluctuations, but if you look at the long-term pattern, um, it almost is self-sustaining in terms of its, uh, its attractiveness and, and, and kind of a self-magnet uh, for the world, which speaks well to our, our future economic development. Uh, in terms of our housing starts in the, the region now, the stats I have here are for the greater Toronto area. We've got so many acronyms or names for our little places, but this would be the underneath of the green belt, if you will. Uh, we've been averaging about 40 to 50,000 starts uh, since the year 2000, uh, about 60,000 in the whole region, and they've uh, basically have uh, maintained uh, throughout. There was, a, of course, a short dip uh, with the recent economic downturn, but they're rebounding uh, incredibly well. Um, two observations I would make here. One is uh, we never had or experienced any issues with subprime mortgages. We didn't really kind of have to go through that phase at all. We have this kind of quaint Canadian tradition of lending money to people who have a hope of paying it back. It's, uh, um, which, uh, you know, not to be glib, but that it, it was owing, I guess, to the Canadian financial system uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the starts in the region weren't artificially, if you will, accelerated or propped up. The other important note I would uh, make is uh, since the beginning of 2000, if you look at the dark colored slide, about 78% of our housing starts are multi-res. Uh, compared to about 30-some uh, percent uh, in the U.S. Now, grant you that the U.S. Uh, starts are, are nationwide, uh, but nonetheless, uh, particularly in the cities of Toronto and that inner ring, a tremendous uh, uh, investment in multi-res construction. That's not to say that uh, everything certainly has been rosy in the region. Um, this uh, slide, while about 10 years old, basically demonstrates that our two rush hours, uh, which used to exist from about 7 until 8 in the morning and then 5 to 6 or 7 in the evening, um, our rush hour is now about 13 hours long in the region. Uh, there's no let up in, uh, in, in traffic and we do, gridlock is uh, a tremendous cost, uh, both socially in terms of time of travel and lost time with uh, family and friends, but also economically there's been a variety of uh, uh, studies uh, undertaken that this could well have cost, I think conservatively, our economy about six billion dollars year, a year in lost productivity. Uh, so it is a real issue. Um, in terms of land use planning in Ontario, um, obviously the project I worked on is the biggest and therefore the most important, very central as you can see from the slide. Um, <laughs> but really the province uh, is uh, constitutionally responsible for municipal local government. Uh, and over the years it has uh, delegated uh, a lot of the planning decisions to municipal government uh, 
Um, and certainly there's been various uh, ebbs and flows of provincial, if you were to talk to a municipal leader, interference in planning. Uh, but we do set up on the left the kind of uh, legislative framework in the Ontario Planning Act and issue things like you see on the, uh, the bottom uh, corner there, the provincial policy statement, which is a kind of a, uh, it's a very nice document, uh, very lofty goals about um, what planning should achieve. But having said that, it has a very loose uh, standard, uh, uh, basically have regard to, and because it is province-wide, some of its directions can be uh, um, interpreted, if you will, uh, for local advantage. Um, in the middle, and I'll come back to this a bit, is that the province did maintain, obviously, the authority to issue specific plans and has done so on occasion. And on the far right, of course, where the vast majority of local decision making and local planning occurs at the municipal level, basically manifesting itself in official planning documents uh, for the lower, uh, lower tier governments and regions. Now, just those three examples you see, um, each one of these has a separate piece of legislation to give the uh, uh, province more uh, clarity, if not authority. Um, the, the one on the left is the Greenbelt Plan of 2005, which I mentioned, which established that 1.8 million uh, acres of green, protected green, uh, green space. Uh, and on the, the far right is uh, something more recent, uh, the Lake uh, Simcoe Protection Act, because there's a very large cold water lake just to the north of Toronto, which was uh, under tremendous environmental pressure, uh, increasing phosphorus levels. And there's basically a, a specific planning regime put in place to protect, uh, to protect that lake. And in the middle, of course, um, places to grow, <laughs> where the province introduced specific legislation uh, to allow the government or to clarify that the government could issue growth management plans, but also, and more importantly, increase the threshold of compliance, if you will, from a have regard to uh, criteria to municipalities and all planning decisions under the Planning Act must, conf uh, must uh, conform to the policies of the growth plan. So it basically removed any ambiguity. I should say at the outset, in case I forget as I'm going through my presentation though, having said that, while we knew we had to kind of increase the clarity of our kind of provincial policy for planning, particularly as it worked on a large regional basis, we really didn't want to get quote unquote in the weeds either. We knew the province had a role at a kind of a large regional basis but we had an axiom when we were developing the growth plan is that we'll provide as much direction as required but no more. Uh, we could have been very precise in terms of identifying all kinds of individual transit lines and setting individual intensification, but we really felt strongly that, that uh, those types of decisions are better left at the local level. While we set up overall targets and parameters that are measured at a municipal level, there's still a tremendous amount of scope for municipalities to have tailor and, and, and customized decisions to meet those overall uh, provincial uh, directions. Now the need for growth management, uh, again I'm speaking to the choir here today I suppose, but you know, we have done, we did do some modeling uh, going out to the year 2031 if we had the business as usual growth patterns in the region, <coughs> that already intolerable gridlock I mentioned earlier uh, would be forecast to grow about 45% in terms of time traveled. Um, you get the commensurate increase in uh, CO2 uh, emitted by vehicles. Um, conservatively, we would have faced about a 22 or 20% 20 higher infrastructure costs, and in total, we would have consumed about 386 square miles of lost uh, prime uh, agricultural lands and rural lands and important natural systems. And of course, the number of smog days would increase. And there's a a lot more statistics behind that, but uh, basically uh, this enumerated for us and, and, and for others that the status quo wasn't really a viable option. So we introduced legislation in 2005. It's basic, if I'm to describe it simply, it is what we call enabling legislation. It, it gives the government the authority to issue growth plans in any part of the province, uh, and it sets a higher threshold for conformity uh, by all decision makers in the Planning Act and it gave a window of about three years for municipalities to work through all the policies in their uh, municipal official plans so that while all decisions had to conform to the growth plan the day it was passed uh, in June 2005 or, or the growth plan was passed I'm sorry in, in June 2006 
clearly the manifestation of, of, of local decision making and real impact on land use planning will happen through the local uh, government's uh, official plans. We have two plans now underway. The one I'll be speaking primarily of today, the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And we just uh, uh, announced that we would establish a growth plan for Northern Ontario uh, in May 2007. And that plan we've released in a proposed stage, uh, which was just released about a week and a half ago. Uh, and uh, we're, we're working on the implementation. But by and large, the plan in Northern Ontario is focused more on economic development and natural stewardship as opposed to uh, land use planning and dealing with the tremendous amount of growth pressures we're facing. Growth planning uh, principles in the plan, and these will not be uh, news to you, but uh, really it's about, uh, while we often describe it as curbing urban, urban sprawl or being anti-urban sprawl, I really like to, in a non kind of Pollyannish way, describe it as really pro-neighborhood and pro-community to really have a set of policies and investments that create communities with more options for living, working, uh, shopping, and playing. Um, to revitalize downtowns, not just in Toronto, but in at least about 25 urban growth centers throughout the region to really become vibrant centers, to be those places where people, that, that, that they, what, what appeals to people about city living and not just an amalgam or concentration of, of, of residential uh, uh, concentrations of subdivisions. And I, I mentioned the issue of traffic gridlock, which is a, a very uh, important uh, problem for, for the region to make a, a tremendous amounts of investment in transit to offer uh, not just available transit, but viable transit so people will actually choose uh, transit over the automobile and to provide a greater range in choice in, the, in housing types uh, for people in all phases uh, of their life. And to move the model, and I think we have been successful um, and we continue to be successful in moving the model from simply a 40, uh, you know, the choice of a 40 floor condo or a 40 foot single detached home and to really have a, a vibrant kind of uh, full range of multi-rise, uh, uh, mid-size uh, development uh, with as well single uh, uh, detached uh, housing as well. <coughs> Now, how we got to where we got to, um, the government, uh, the previous government in 2001, uh, it was a progressive conservative government. Uh, I guess the comparator here would be a Republican government, um, more right than the liberal government would perhaps be the best way to describe it. Um, created a, a, an initiative, you know, uh, they wanted to have uh, smart growth brought to Ontario. So, one of the first things we did was to establish a smart growth panel. We had five actually across the province, but the one in central Ontario, um, we brought together, there's about 30 people, uh, the leadership of major municipalities, uh, developers, environmental groups, uh, and academia. And they spent uh, the good part of two years uh, meeting, debating, researching, hearing from experts, and came up with, uh, in April uh, 2003, 44 recommendations of how to tackle sprawl uh, and to implement smart growth. A couple of observations I'd make about their work. <coughs> One, it was chaired by Mayor Hazel McCallion, who you may not have heard of in this room, but um, she's quite a dynamo and quite a leader. She's, I think, 88 years old. Um, and no one messes with Hazel. If you know Hazel, you can see her sitting uh, there. She is the um, uh, real municipal, you know, very much a uh, municipal leader in Canada uh, and very uh, focused and became quite a convert to uh, smart growth in the region. And she used to be called the Queen of Sprawl and then uh, kind of took a trip to Damascus and uh, really kind of uh, uh, came about. And so she was powerful, as well as there were some leading municipal leaders in the group, uh, as well as uh, environmental groups and, and the development industry, some of our larger development, developments. And it was quite interesting, early days of this group, uh, and I'm not even putting this so simply, um, developers basically came in the room thinking any regulation is a bad regulation. Environmentalists had the view that any growth is bad growth. And Municipal leaders were like, well, what the hell is the province doing in our jurisdiction? So needless to say, this group didn't start off uh, 
uh, holding hands, but throughout the process they realized that the challenges that were facing the region were larger than any of those one constituent groups. Uh, for example, uh, Mississauga and Mira Hazel McCallion. She soon realized that gridlock didn't start on the east side of the border of Mississauga and end at the west side of uh, the, the border of Mississauga. And developers realized that the model of continually building single detached homes in the, hint, uh, in the outside green space wasn't exactly a sustainable model either and that there were real benefits from intensification and the environmental community soon realized that um, if we are going to have 3.7 million more people come to this region it is a far better set of policies to anticipate that and intensify than simply uh, stick your head in the ground and hope it doesn't happen because that kind of ostrich approach to planning you know we've seen the the downside of that so the other observation I make is that <coughs> it was an important first consensus where um, you know Mayor Hazel and the, the head of Mattamy development and uh, save the Oak Ridges Moraine all could sit on the same stage and speak uh, together. So it was very good that we had consensus at the leadership level. I would make the observation that it didn't quite funnel down to its complete membership, but that was important. <coughs> Second of all, the recommendations they made were good, but they were very directional. They basically said things like, we need and should have more compact urban form. So it left the obvious question, okay, that's good. How do you do that? And what kind of policies? So then uh, they released the report in April. Uh, two to three months later, uh, we had an election in Ontario and the Liberal government won. And uh, um, for those of you who have been involved in public policy and, and, and public servants, of course, we were always tracking their uh, party platforms. And there was you know, about three lines given to the fact that the Liberal government had promised a growth management plan for uh, the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Needless to say, I lifted that out and increased the font very largely uh, in our first briefing. And uh, the government was very committed, and uh, the minister we had of the day, uh, the Honorable David Kaplan, really became enamored uh, with the initiative and, and personalized it and moved, moved forward with it. At the same time, of course, we were tracking every jurisdiction around the world who was playing in this uh, field, probably of some 200 jurisdictions worldwide, many of them in the United States. Uh, and as I've always said, plagiarism is policy's best friend. So we really uh, reviewed and, and analyzed, not so much uh, as, as rigorously as Armando's work at the Institute, uh, but certainly had a steady policy watch on what was happening in other regions and talking to people and, and you know, looking at jurisdictions that had legislation versus those that didn't and some of the policies that they had and the investments that they made or didn't make. So in terms of the kind of uh, chromosomal development of the plan. This looks like a very long process, uh, but it was a very iterative process, and it, and it is important, I think, how we did this. Now, some would say we might have overdone it, but it starts with the um, release of the Smart Growth Panel's report in April 2003, and then when the new government came in, uh, we released a discussion paper in July 2004, which basically took some of those loftier goals and drilled them down in somewhat more detail. And then in February, we released a draft growth plan, which had very precise policies. Now, all along this, this period, up until February, we were engaged extensively with stakeholders and those constituent parts I, to I, I was t sp uh, speaking about earlier, um, environmental groups, development industry, and individual home builders and developers, uh, municipal governments, and that net uh, broadened, uh, and academia. So we really worked hard. Now, You'll notice we have a draft growth plan and a proposed growth plan uh, between February and November. And um, basically how that came about was as we were releasing the draft, uh, sometimes the legislative and policy regimes don't line up. So we didn't get our legislation into uh, the legislature. It wasn't passed until uh, June of that time. And of course, that was after we released the draft plan. And in our legislation, we have a very prescribed consultation process that we have to undertake. Now, there was a lot of people saying, well, look, you already did all that consultation. Why don't you just grandfather it? And I was thinking, oh, great. So we're going to have this great democratic clause in our legislation. And the first thing we do out the door is grandfather it. So I said, no, no, let's take what we've heard and refine it even further. So we had a proposed plan. In normal course of business, we probably would have combined those two. But again, 
It allowed another window of opportunity where we could really go and talk to people. And these were the uh, points at which we were having really detailed debates and discussions, say, with the development industry, as an example, about what our intensification rate should be. How are we going to measure it? Uh, so we were quite open. So it was unique, at least from a provincial government perspective, that um, we were as open and as detailed uh, with this kind of a process. Queen's Park, or the provincial government, is usually infamous for talking to a few people, going away, uh, implementing, a, you know, developing a policy and just hoisting it upon the world. Uh, this was very different, and this was quite open. We had a series of town hall meetings, and as I said, uh, multi-stakeholder sessions, individual meetings, dinners, breakfasts, and I, I always joke with our, uh, our friends, uh, stakeholder friends, that, uh, you know, I like to claim we, we, we generated this great consensus, but I, I fear people just get sick and tired of meeting with me. But when you get to that point of being, you know, almost boring and they're tired of you, uh, I think that's a good barometer for the amount of stakeholder consultation that you've done. And I've also said, too, is if people can't see themselves in that report or the policies, uh, they at least understand why not. Uh, so it really was an organic process. And I would argue led to the success uh, that we've had, not just in the releasing of the final plan in June 2006, but the reception it's received and how it's being implemented. Another uh, feature of this, and again, just to cite the uh, intensification with the development industry, is of course there was a great debate, you know, whether intensification is too high, too low, um, and, and whether we should have it at all. But throughout this period of debate with the development industry, they soon kind of realized, well, wait now, there's a positive aspect to this for us because, um, you know, there's a long litany of developers that want to do intensification projects in downtowns and along quarters that find themselves at the Ontario Municipal Board being challenged uh, in terms of height and, and, and size and scope and the rest. So they went from fighting intensification to actually wanting us to have more intensification rates because they realized that it would reduce some of the NIMBY opposition that they faced uh, um, uh, in trying to, to bring developments on stream. The growth plan was, I mean, uh, released and in the, the home of all truth. Uh, if you don't know that, the Toronto Star newspaper, uh, we got some good coverage on day one, uh, actually uh, garnered uh, uh, three pages of uh, full coverage, which I think is just basically speaks that how this is, uh, this issue of gridlock and sprawl has kind of hit the, the public uh, awareness. Now some of the, the key policies of the growth plan, and again I'd ask you to uh, visit placestogrow.ca for more details because I'll try to just give you a bit of a, a high level flyby of some of the policies. Uh, and uh, the plan does include uh, very detailed policies and they are all integrated. One of the first, and, and, and may not seem as, uh, as important, but one of the things that we did was provide a coordinated set of growth forecasts for cities and regions. And why was this important? Well, first of all, it put the whole region on a kind of a single methodology of forecasting how much growth we are going to have. Because as you know, the population growth is basically the core number that will drive a lot of land use decisions, primarily and particularly land budgets and urban boundary expansions. So what was the problem with this before? Mainly it was a lot of our official plans and municipal planning was based on what I'll call aspirational planning, that if someone wanted uh, more land brought on stream or developers were particularly effective in lobbying certain councils, uh, it was not a very difficult trick just to simply up your population forecast out uh, uh, in, the, in the out years, therefore everything tumbling back justifying to bring more lands on stream and therefore development approvals. And so there was a lot of, and similarly if municipalities uh, um, did not want to anticipate growth, uh, could lowball their uh, population forecast and the reverse was true but basically what that ended up with was a lot of local disjuncture between what was ha like the reality and, 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 uh, um, and their decision making so this removed some of that so the population forecast and employment forecasts that we provide basically have to be built in that's our first check with local um, local uh, plans and uh, again, this is important. Uh, you'll recall that I uh, cited um, the Lake Simcoe Protection Act. Uh, our forecast, which is legitimate, and we've, it's been verified in the recent census numbers, we basically had said that area um, could probably anticipate about 667,000 people uh, 
uh, and we, that's been again reconfirmed with the recent census, but there were very large development uh, and developers pushing projects that would have had that number uh, closer to about 1.3 or 1.4 uh, million people, and I would argue artificially pulling people uh, from uh, the inner uh, core uh, to a very sensitive uh, environmental area. <coughs> Um, I talked about, it again, one of the uh, key chapters is, uh, is um, uh, uh, on managing growth, and I, I've talked a bit about that, but maybe I'll just uh, talk a, a bit more about some of the specific policies. And, and maybe I'm running to those policies where people tend to run to and, and focus a bit more than I should perhaps on the mathematics of it all. But one of our other key policies is that we have um, in the plan is that 40% of new residential growth must occur within the existing built-up area for each upper and single-tier municipality by 2015. Now, let me just unpack that for a moment. Two observations about that. 40% isn't measured at a whole regional basis. So, in other words, Toronto, which is effectively at 100%, uh, doesn't kind of uh, uh, give a free ride to, to those other municipalities. You'll recall my first map, there was a, uh, a series of regional governments. That's where this 40% is measured. Now, in the non-Toronto part of the region, um, and, and there was not good stats kept on this, but we figured about anywhere between, uh, the intensification rate was anywhere between 10 and 15 percent. So we basically have uh, more than double the rate of intensification uh, by the year 2015. Now, one of the challenges we had is we couldn't measure this before because it's not a land use designation in the usual sense of the word. But if you look at that little schematic, we basically came up with a methodology that uh, defines the so-called built-up area, the dark purple, uh, and literally will map and has mapped where the concrete stops and where the green begins. Uh, this is important, A, to measure our intensification, but also for our greenfield policies as well. The light purple is areas that are approved for development but uh, haven't uh, been built yet. Now, we also have policies regarding revitalizing downtowns. There's about 25 urban growth centers. Uh, in the region, now, uh, we have a whole suite of policies beyond just density, but we do uh, delineate downtowns of the 25 core areas and identify policies to promote mixed-use economic centers for them, to be uh, pedestrian transit supportive, to be focal points for regional services as well as provincial investments. Uh, and it is also our key transportation nodes because the province is now back in the game of transit We've established Metrolinx, which is a region-wide authority, and Metrolinx's work is basically now charged with connecting the dots um, uh, for the transportation plan for the region. Now, to help that, among other things, is that we established minimum density targets uh, for those centers. And for the four urban growth centers in Toronto, that would be about 400 people and jobs per hectare, or that translates into 180 jobs and people per acre. Uh, and for cities within the green belt <coughs> or south, uh, we established uh, core densities of 200 jobs and people, or about 80 people and jobs uh, per acre. And for the outer ring, the more rural part, uh, downtown cores of 150 jobs uh, per acre, or about 60 uh, people and jobs uh, per hectare. Now, we also have policies that major transit station areas uh, have to intensify but that would be left to local areas, and again, uh, commensurate with the level of existing and planned transit areas. So now municipalities are identifying these transit station areas and developing policies uh, for intensification. Same thing with corridors. Uh, we've asked municipalities to identify intensification corridors and to set uh, intensification rates to allow them to develop to the kind of uh, neighborhoods and communities that you see here to get back in the game of Main Street development as opposed to simply just approving subdivisions and knitting a subdivision together with a subdivision with a subdivision, which is the development pattern that we had before. So for municipalities to achieve their intensification strategies, they are instructed to intensify in their downtown cores, along major transit areas, and as well in intensification corridors. And there's tremendous opportunity for intensification here through gray fields uh, and underused uh, uh, commercial um, <coughs> activity and bringing, bringing things closer to the street and, and above the street. Now, in terms of greenfield development, there will always be suburbia. 
uh, it'll be of a different mix and configuration. Um, literally what we saw in the region, we actually had pretty good densities in terms of greenfield development, but it was, as someone once described it, wasted densities because the configuration of suburbia with a lot of cul-de-sac development with literally seas of subdivisions being knitted together, the physical introduction of transit uh, became very difficult. So as new developments happen, we're requiring uh, uh, municipalities to um, develop at a rate of about 50 people and jobs uh, per hectare. And I'm trying to do the conversion in my head, 20-ish people and jobs per acre. Now that's measured over a whole region. So one can imagine um, mid-sized density, as you see in the top uh, picture, surrounded by uh, more dense, better laid out suburbia, and that again could be surrounded by yet again uh, more rural type development. But it really is to kind of get that gradient mix uh, and not just simply build uh, the same subdivision uh, over and over again. When you say 50 people plus jobs combined, does that mean it could be 50 people and no jobs at one extreme, zero people and 50 jobs yeah. at the other. Okay, yeah. thank you. And it is measured over a whole region, so it's not every project, which is important. But we thought it was important to, uh, if nothing else, spiritually get the concept that we are no longer in the game of putting all our people here and all our jobs over here. And that, um, you know, we looked at setting those rates out, you know, for example, the 50 jobs and people per hectare what is a minimum requirement for frequent bus service? Uh, and that seemed to be a, a good, and we, we scaled our densities uh, that way. We don't prescribe particular, but it is not a bad mix. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about a two to one mix, you know, in certain areas. We didn't prescribe it, uh, but the point being is that, um, you know, we have to, again, move away from uh, segmenting our development if we're gonna have those kind of communities where people can like walk the streets and not just have these mega, um, regional you know, shopping centers uh, surrounded by uh, single detached homes. Now obviously another key implementation, another part of the plan is that we commit the province to making infrastructure investments to support the growth patterns that we are uh, focusing on. And again, uh, the proof here kind of is in the pudding and the province I am happy to say has stepped up to the plate and not only established Metrolink's regional transit authority, but has also put $17.5 billion on the table uh, to expand uh, both subway uh, and light uh, and, and higher order transit uh, throughout the region. <coughs> and not only, and here's the, the, one of the implementation challenges we face, I, I don't want to say challenges, but um, untapped opportunities might be a better way to put it. It was clear what we had to do on transit. That was almost obvious. Uh, but there's a whole secondary set of infrastructure decisions the province makes, but was making them absent of land use consideration. And I'll cite, for example, siting of hospitals, which tend to be very large employers. The way we typically cited a hospital historically in the region was that someone on the board was very rich and owned a bunch of land and died and bequeathed a bunch of land to the hospital and therefore uh, put it on the outskirts of town as opposed to keeping it downtown where it could be e more easily accessible by transit and by more people. Um, the other challenge with hospitals is through our capital funding formula, uh, we tend not to pay for parking, for example, so therefore people want surface parking, hospital boards and the like, so you know, they tend to want to gravitate to greenfield development. So what we're working with now are in our colleague ministries is as they're doing their capital planning with PIR, previous PIR in energy and infrastructure, that we have a set of criteria and tests as they do their annual capital plan about where their capital is being invested and why not in the downtown urban cores. So we're trying to rebalance or recalibrate how capital planning decisions um, get made. For example, uh, one successful example we have, and I think uh, there is an exa uh, the one in the middle is a uh, regional courthouse in Durham. Um, we had to redevelop the area, and of course the judiciary wanted a uh, site on a greenfield, uh, which would have been outside town, and we were advocating for a, a site in downtown Oshawa. So surprisingly how uh, adept the judiciary came at arguing the environmental dangers of brownfield redevelopment. Um, <laughs> 
But as my minister most famously put it, actually, the deputy came in and said, look, the deputy attorney general's on the phone. They got some real concerns about the site location, you know, Brownfield, yada, yada, yada. And the minister just turned to the deputy and said, listen, we're redeveloping downtown Toronto uh, waterfront where children will be playing. I think the judges will be safe. And just close the books and it stayed in downtown. But these are the kinds of decisions that we have a big impact that we are, we are, we are trying to, to work through. And it's not something you can kind of do by legislation, but um, through uh, coercion and moral suasion, perhaps. <coughs> the plan also is not just talking about where and how to grow, but also what to protect. I, I mentioned the separate policies we have with Lake Simcoe and the Green Belt, but we also put in, uh, in place higher thresholds for moving urban boundaries, for example. Um, a number of new tests, one of course the population forecast, two it can't really undermine your intensification strategies or your density strategies and that it has to be uh, sustainable both from an infrastructure investment perspective but also an environmental perspective as well. So no more are we just kind of moving boundaries based on uh, aspirational planning or the strong arm perhaps of the development industry. I think one of the added benefits of issuance of the plan and the province uh, um, uh, getting back in the game in a big way, and I, and I don't want to sound paternalistic at all, but I think there is something real to the fact that um, we're best able to deal with very large developers, let me put it that way, because they have interests all across the region. So we're less susceptible to uh, strong lobbying, if I can put it politely, uh, from the development industry. So we deal with them on a you know, fairly large basis. So they come to the table realizing that they really don't want to make enemies out of the province. Uh, not that we're a vindictive group, but they realize that you know, we, there's a lot of planning decisions both now and down the road. Whereas an individual municipality, particularly if that uh, municipality doesn't have a well-established planning department, is more rural in nature, someone comes to town with a couple of baubles, you know, and, and I, I don't mean to demonize the development industry at all, but uh, let me just say I think it's, it's a more fairer debate uh, having the province sit at the table with very, very large uh, economic interests, and I think it has worked well. Similarly, as we're working, for example, with uh, one of our big box uh, developers, uh, very hard for an individual municipality to challenge uh, a big box development because that can simply move to another jurisdiction, if you will, or across the just or right across the boundary. But as we're talking to uh, large um, store and retail development, and we're getting into this work more and more, um, Costco, Walmart, Home Depot aren't going to walk away from what will be the fourth largest urban region in North America. So if we can also standardize rules across municipal boundaries as well, realizing and recognizing retail uh, you know, has to occur, it's a consumer choice, and, but at the same time, I think we're more successful at putting policies across um, the region. Now in terms of uh, implementation, municipal conformity, this is where municipalities are doing the homework, if you will, and, and infusing the policies and targets and the growth plan into their official planning documents. And we've been actively working with all 110 municipalities. Uh, some have worked very well with us, others, you know, a bit of a challenge. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, the, uh, the legal requirement is for municipalities to conform and our kind of adjudicating body, the Ontario Municipal Board as well, has to conform to the policies of the growth plan. So in many ways, there's no way around it. But I, I, I'm heartened that um, while legislation is, is fundamentally important, I think, we're actually implementing this uh, much more through moral suasion and cooperation than coercive uh, action. Uh, uh, having said that, I don't think our moral suasion would be as effective if there wasn't the legislative backing and, and, and the like. Clearly, uh, their, their lawyers uh, will, will give them advice as to how much they can, quote, push us or, or bend the rules. Uh, but I must say, it, it, we're not at that uh, stage of fighting with municipalities that we're after threatening to take them to the OMB or anything like that. So uh, we've had some great squabbles along the way and we will continue in the future, but uh, we've been quite uh, occupied with this. And along the way, we're doing a lot of technical analysis and further research. I mentioned the built boundary methodology. Uh, we're also, you know, issued uh, scope and uh, size and scale for urban growth centers. And another area where we, we, we've, we've been out with a draft paper, but what we've got to come back to is the whole planning for employment issue. Uh, and this is a bit of a challenge. Um, quite clearly, when one is doing land use planning, residential planning and long-term growth management is easy when it comes to residential compared to employment because uh, 
I'm an economist, and probably one of the few areas of economics that's actually worth anything is demography. It's fairly easy to figure out. You know, people live, people die, people move in, people, you know, every year people get a year older. Uh, so it's a fairly stable demand uh, to forecast, generally speaking. Uh, and land demand, as it relates to residential, is, is fairly easy to get your head around. Employment, a whole lot different. Uh, forecasting out numbers of jobs and types of jobs and the spatial location of those jobs a lot more difficult. So when it comes to um, forecasting for population-based employment or employment-based employment, which uh, or you know industrial industrial jobs uh, versus major office, it becomes a lot more problematic and difficult. Worse is that municipal. I don't want to say worse, but adding to that challenge, municipalities. Uh, and their official plans have a myriad of designations for employment. Uh, so you get a lot of you know, very different rules in, in depending on the municipality that you're operating in, in terms of what's allowed. Some places will have very vague employment, just as it's employment lands, therefore it's a commercial activity it can locate, locate there. Others will allow certain types, mixes and the like. Not standardized at all, and, and, and I'm all for not you know, one size not fitting all, but it, 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 it goes beyond the bounds of flexibility and really enters the world of entropy and just confusion. So we want to get a bit of better of a handle on employment land planning uh, in the region because it does have some real consequences. For example, I mentioned major retail. Um, basically, municipalities' employment lands policies were fairly passive, but yet when someone wants to cite a big box or a major retail, they became more quite impassioned about op, you know, opposing it, but yet their own rules allowed for it. So what we're saying to municipalities is don't come to the province and complain that a major retail is coming to your you know, municipality near you. You've got the authority, and so you've got to implement. So what we, what we want to do is provide some positive help for them and, and kind of, okay, how can we plan for major retail, for example, in an urban setting? Because uh, quite frankly, we're not going to turn back the clock. People aren't going to want to go to that one hardware store where there's one saw behind the counter. They like going to Home Depot. But we have good examples uh, in Toronto of major uh, urban designed uh, classic suburban big box stores or entrance, you know. So it's about form and it's about location and it's about actively planning for it. <coughs> I mentioned the capital uh, investment portfolio and again, both in terms of the level and type of investments we're making but also uh, in locations as well. Lots of expansions again in the college and university sector. A lot of uh, uh, Mc campuses, if you will, uh, pro uh, uh, developing in, in uh, smaller areas. So we want to make sure that these are, aren't in greenfields, that they're integrated into uh, downtown communities. The province also holds a significant amount of real estate. Now, primarily and, uh, his or historically, um, the province held its land and basically when it uh, sold off land assets, uh, it was primarily fiscally driven. Uh, how much land value can we get? Um, now we're turning our attention, how can we strategically partner with the development industry to um, you know, get the kind of development we want, but also in reality increase the value of our asset. We own tremendous amounts of land around all the major transportation corridors and where commuter rail exists, but instead of just selling that off to a developer, we're actually starting to become active partners with the development industry and, uh, and looking to you know, use that as another, either a lever or an incentive uh, for the developer to do a different uh, type of development. And we have a couple of examples which you wouldn't be familiar with in Midtown Oakville, uh, right around uh, our commuter rail, but also in Langstaff Gateway in Markham where we have our, our subway, our commuter rail, our 400 series highway, and some light transit all coming together. And we're actually doing a pretty exciting development. Uh, Peter Calth uh, Calthorpe was involved in that one about really almost creating a new mini city uh, just north of Toronto. Another important component that we knew from the beginning and we've been fairly active in, not as active as I would like, but uh, uh, certainly more active than in most uh, government initiative, and that is in public outreach. I mean, speaking to rooms like this, you know, you're fairly sophisticated in your appreciation of the costs and benefits of growth, but really getting into neighborhoods and to talk to people uh, and taxpayers, if you will, about what are the choices and, and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, we, we've got lots of visualizations, uh, hosted public forums, uh, developed a lot of educational materials, uh, 
um, held a couple of summits and things like that. But you know, this is an area where we really have to democratize the debate uh, even more. But one project that I'm really excited about, and I've just got, if you bear with me, just kind of a minute uh, snapshot video, it's our youth engagement project. Now this is something that we want to extend uh, even further. Um, but basically what we've done is we've taken kids from our urban growth centers, about eight to ten uh, kids each, and uh, put them together um, to work in chat room environment, uh, basically to describe what they like about their downtowns, what they don't like about their downtowns, and then hook them up with some experts, bring them together, and they actually do some neat foam modeling and the like. This is a project that we've done for three years now. The kids love it. They do great work. And we're now looking at kind of democratizing that and, and get a kind of a third party manager because it does take a bit of uh, resources to get it going. But there's just a quick, uh, quick video here to give you a sense. Something needs to be done over here, and we need to encourage some kind of, we need to encourage retail business in the area. The youth are uh, very, very uh, essential uh, spokespeople for what goes on in the community. They're on foot, they're on uh, bike, they're on rollerblades and skateboards. Hi, I'm Aaron Smith. They have a perspective which is extraordinarily uh, important. There's a lot of busy, crowded streets, so it'd be really nice if we had kind of a European street solely for walking yeah. and having like open cafes with exactly. having a community garden or something on the top. It's interesting, that's a theme that's been picked up by quite a few of these. They'll be engaged in these kind of discussions that occur in their local community, so we're creating uh, new champions here, I'm sure. Anyway, just a small example uh, of, of some of the work that we've done. The kids are great, I tell you. They're not afraid of heights. They get it. Uh, you know, they don't have to be convinced uh, um, of the need to do something. So uh, I'd just like to wrap up by uh, thanking you uh, for coming and listening to what we've been doing in Ontario. And i uh, really like to thank you for your time uh, and consideration and patience. Thank you.